Be on. Am I on? I'm on two, one, two. There we go. Thank you. If we haven't met, my name's Guy Feltman. Um, one of the elders here, my wife Cheryl, uh, is involved in children's ministry. She's at the top there. And maybe the team could wait on us for our tithes and our offerings. If we could do that. Just to say as well, week today, so the 4th of February, next Sunday, we are launching our life group officially in Malalan. We had a um, leader's vision launch yesterday, and one of the families from Malalan was here with us, him and his family. And it was just great hearing their excitement for the launch. We managed to secure the Malalan Golf Club, which is very exciting. Um, Alan Parfit always says, go where the life of God is. And it just seems like there's life in this whole Malalan launch. So the dream is to start a, a life group there in the afternoons, Sunday afternoon, every second Sunday. And then hopefully it'll gain momentum and the dream is for it to become a church. That's where we're going, hopefully, if, uh, if that is the will of God, which we think it is. So let me pray as we get ready for the word. Lord, thank you for what you've done this morning. Thank you that your presence is so real and so tangible. And I ask, Lord, that as we just talk about our calling this morning, that lights would come on for some of us, that faith would start to rise up again in some of us who have lost faith in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. We started a series last week called Engage. And we try and run it at the beginning of every year. It's a four-week, three to four-week series. This year it's four. And um, it really is just revisiting some of the basics that kind of get us ready for the year, I guess. So last week I spoke about um, community, the importance of living in community. God has not called us to live in isolation. I said, and I believe this with all my heart, I have never, ever seen isolation to be ever helpful. Never. I've never once, unless it's God isolating you for a short season of time for prayer or, or whatever, but when, when a person withdraws from the fire, the coal analogy, you take that coal out the fire, I've never ever seen it to be positive because God hasn't designed Christians ever to run alone. And when they do, they normally get into trouble because it's not God's design. This morning I want to talk about calling. And um, like we do at the beginning of every year, uh, linked to this message is what we call Involvement Sunday, where we're going to give people opportunities at the end of this to actually sign up for ministries that they want to get involved in. But again, like I said last, last week when I spoke about life groups, joining life groups, it's not a project to see how many life groups we can have or how many can sign up. That just becomes like a sales market, and that's not what we're on on about it all. And this morning isn't to see how many people can sign up for ministries, although that would be good. But what we're wanting is to get the heart behind this message. Why must we be involved in local church? Because God has a lot to say about that. So that's what we're exploring this morning. And, and the question I want to kick off with is, what is our calling? It's, it's such a broad question, isn't it? Like if I had to say to you, what's your calling? What are you called to do? It's so broad. It's like, well, I don't know. Does that mean business? If you're a scholar, does that mean my calling at school? Have I got a calling there? Is it linked to the church? Does my calling in church qualify my calling out in the world? There's a lot of confusion around this, and I want to try and take some of that away by opening up with a scripture that I think uh, should answer that for us. And it's Matthew 10, 7 and 8. I'm going to ask if you've got your Bibles in whatever form or format, to please take those out, even though the, the Scriptures are on the board. Matthew 10. This is Jesus speaking. In fact, quite, it's quite a significant moment for Jesus and his team, his disciples. He actually, after being with them for a little while, he kind of kicks them out the nest. 
And he says to them, I now want you to go. I'm staying behind. I want you guys to go. And he gives them some instructions of what they should do. And this is what it looks like. He says, as you go, proclaim this message. So they got one message in their mouths that they're carrying, one message in their heart, and this is it. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Old Testament, the kingdom of heaven had not come near. There was this great divide between man and God. And God would send people along the way, prophets and priests and godly kings who would come and who would try and represent to the people what God was like. And there would be moments where the Holy Spirit would come upon people and it would become evident that, oh, this is what God is like. In the New Testament, when Jesus came, He, he, he bridged that divide. He broke that gap. He filled it. And it's a beautiful picture. The cross for me is a beautiful picture between God and mankind. The connection from, from earth to heaven happened in the form of a cross. And the cross called, caused us now to have our own relationship with God. And the heart is this. The kingdom of heaven has come near you. Do you know when I use the word kingdom, I know, I know there's a lot of religious or Christian jargon in the church. If you've been saved for a long time, like many of us have, you kind of develop this. I find myself often, because I'm such a church mouse, been in church life for so long, I, I sometimes find myself speaking this, this kind of, it's like a, it's like a church language. And it's not always helpful, but it, sometimes you just can't help it. But when I use the word kingdom, it comes to me with such conviction. I, I really believe it. I, I, I picture it. I see it. The kingdom for me is God's world. It's, it's, it's His order. It's what He reigns over, what He rules over. And part of that is heaven, but another part of what He reigns over is earth. And so when we read this, the kingdom of heaven has come near, it's like God's world, what happens in heaven because of the cross, there's no longer a gap. His world has now been pushed or released or poured out upon earth. His kingdom, we now have access to His kingdom, His world. His, his reality now becomes ours. And we don't have to wait till we get to heaven before we can experience heaven. We can experience it now. That's what this means. The kingdom of heaven is near. It's at hand. There is no longer a gap between mankind and God. We can now walk in unity with God. We can walk in the miraculous. We can hear God on the run. We don't leave God at home when we go to school or church or university or the bowling club. He comes with us. We go with Him. It's this partnership. And as we go, there's this, there's this, this silent listening. It's this posture of, Lord, what are you saying? Not religiously so, that looks weird, where we can't connect with people, but it's just a consciousness, an awareness of the fact, His kingdom is now in me. It's around me. I have access to His kingdom. That's what goes through my mind when I mention the word kingdom, because I think that's what the Bible is emphasizing. And then, what does the kingdom look like? When, when He says to His disciples, the kingdom of heaven has come near, what does it look like? I would like to suggest that what we're now going to read, in essence, is the calling on your life of every believer. What's my calling, Lord? It's this. As you go, oh, sorry, verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead. I think we're going to see a whole lot more dead people being raised where it's going to become semi-normal. At the moment, I've met a few people in my life not a whole bunch, a few that have raised the dead before. I've had the privilege of speaking to them and asking them questions around that. But at, at the moment, it's like, wow. But I think there's going to come a time where it's not wow. It's like, yo, that's about right. That's what his kingdom does. If someone dies prematurely, then surely you and I as believers can say, no, that's premature death. I can want you to rise up in Jesus' name. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Sometimes this loses us because leprosy for us is not an overly, it's not something we understand like it was common in, in Jesus' day. I guess in our day it would be cancer or AIDS. Cleanse those with cancer. Why does it just have to be a, a select few that have had the privilege of seeing a cancer just 
melt as, you, as we pray for them and suddenly they're healed of cancer. Why can't that become normal? Jesus seems to be indicating it by saying, the kingdom of heaven has come near you. Go do this stuff. It's normal. Drive out demons. Christians should never be afraid of demons. <laughs> we have authority over them. They fear believers. Sometimes we fear them way more than they fear us. Freely you have received, freely give. What's my calling, God? That's your calling. Every believer, I believe, that's the mandate, that's the commission, that's the cloud that rests over your life is go walk in this thing, go walk this thing out. It changes everything. It makes getting up in the morning after you've had your post toasties or wheat picks for breakfast. It changes the dynamic. I'm not just going to work. I'm not just going to do this. I'm going to let the kingdom leak out of me. I've got this lovely flashlight here. It's a, probably a bit of a silly example, but I can't think of a better one. I almost see you and I as believers being like this flashlight. It's just kind of wherever we go, if this is the light of Jesus that's in me, it's a silly example because the light is way greater than this. And, and with the light in this building, you can hardly see it. But when I stand on our deck at night, we overlook a Mac, Mac plantation. And when I bring this thing out, I can see, I can see an owl in a tree. I can see a water buck that's come to our fence before. I've seen warthog before. It picks up the slightest of the slight. It just, it just magnifies everything. And I believe that's what we carry as believers. We take this light, and the light of God penetrates the darkness, and it brings God's world to mankind around us. It, it brings all sorts of reactions around us. When you believe this stuff and you speak it and you just, sometimes you don't even have to speak it, you just leak it and you find these interesting reactions around you where people start acting differently and it gets so fun. It's like, and sometimes it's a negative reaction where they, they, they don't like the Spirit of God that's in us and, and, it's a, and they might push us away. Other times you find in conversation they just start telling you everything about their lives. It's like, that's not normal, but yet it is. Because they're not drawn to us, they're drawn to the light of Christ in us. That's what it means to take this kingdom. The kingdom of heaven has come. Therefore, because his kingdom has come, go. Go. When you're going to work, you're not just going to work to sign contracts or to lead staff. You're going to work to, to leak the kingdom. Anything could happen at any time because this light exposes all sorts of things around us. What's my calling, guy? That's your calling. How exciting is that? I mean, it honestly changes the way you do life. There's this anticipation every single day after eating your wheat picks or your bacon and egg or whatever it is. I'm on mission. I'm going to go give the old devil a hard time. Our calling is our life. At work, at rest, at school, we are shining the light of the kingdom wherever we go. Having said that, the church does play a huge role in our calling. And this is where I want to marry the two. The, the lifestyle calling, which I've just spoken about, that we all have. And now how does the church play a role in that? And we need to look at the Scriptures to, to answer that question. If you could turn to Ephesians 3, please, verse 10. Ephesians 3, 10. This is Paul speaking to the Ephesian church, and he says, his intent, that's God's intent, Intent, intentionality, his desire, his dream is as follows. That through the church, the manifold wisdom of Christ, manifold simply means multifaceted. The best example of that is a diamond that's been cut. And as you turn a diamond around with light reflecting on it, it's just got all sorts of patterns that come off of it. That's what it's talking about here. God is so multifaceted. He's so big in his ways. He's just so vast. His his manifold wisdom should be made known 
to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Can I read that again? Because we've got to catch this. God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God will be made known to rulers, principalities, in heavenly realms, according to His eternal purpose that He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, through Jesus, because of Jesus' power that rests within us, God's intent, what He dreams of, what He longs for, what He's mobilizing an army for, is that His church would take God's wisdom into the world. That rulers and principalities and powers, the demonic realm as well as the angelic realm, I believe. Like God's saying, these realms, these invisible realms around us, will know God's wisdom through the church. The church has this unusual power. It's the most fascinating thing for me that in many ways God's restricted himself to the church. I say restricted because sometimes we are the restricting factors. When we don't believe this stuff, we limit what God actually wants to do. But when a church catches this and we're on fire for Him and we believe this stuff, what happens is the wisdom of God, God's world, God's awesomeness is taken into the world. It's the vehicle is the church. The vehicle to carry the mighty power of God into the world is through the church. He could have made it any other vehicle, but He said through the church. God's wisdom will be made known to the demonic realm, the angelic realm, and everything in between. Which puts this incredible responsibility in the hands of the church. When people don't get this, you can see it through their lifestyle because they don't take the church seriously. They're casual attendees. Go when they want to. Everything revolves around them. And we love them to bits, but we want to kick their butts and say, can't you see it's way bigger than just you or your world or your family? You're carrying the light. You're carrying the message corporately with us. If we all catch this thing, every church on the planet, can you imagine how powerful the church would be? The wisdom of God, God's mag magnificence will, be, will, will ring out to the world through the church. What about parachurch organizations? We love parachurch organizations. We really do. And I think there's a place for them. Provided they linked into local church. What parachurch organizations do, or mission organizations, or whatever you want to call them, is they hone in on a specific thing. They feel God's called them to, to have a specific influence in the community. And I think we celebrate those things. But if they do that in an isolated fashion, it's not helpful. If they bring their gift into the local church, and there are a number of you who actually belong to those that are part of this church, you see the beauty and the value of church and you bring your ministries into local church, I think it's really powerful. We can conclude, therefore, from the Scripture that we've just read that part of our calling out there has to do with our involvement in the local church. Does that make sense? If God's rulership and His reign and His magnificence is going to be taken into the world and into these atmospheres around us through the church, then we need to be very involved in the church. It's His vehicle. The church is His vehicle. I sometimes think, Lord, that's a big risk you took. Like, why, why, why that? Why limit yourself to the church? Because sometimes we're feeble. Sometimes we're frail. Sometimes we're disobedient. Sometimes we we just do things in our own terms. <clears throat> why, Lord? I don't know why. But I've just said yes. <laughs> and when you get the stuff, you start to love the local church. You, you don't see it as a group of people or a club or, or just a, a meeting once a week that benefits you. You see this as, I must do life with these guys because that seems to be what Jesus gave himself up for. In Ephesians, when he talks to husbands about their love for their wives, it's the most amazing thing. He brings the church into that thing as well. And he says, husbands, this is how I want you to love your wives. As Christ loved the church, there it is again, Christ loved the church. That's every local church. So husbands must love their wives. As Christ loved the church 
And there's another little sentence added to that. And gave himself up for her. How much does Christ love the church? This much. To give yourself up for, in Jesus' case, was death. So his love for the church and for mankind took him to the cross. And he's saying, as much as I've done this for you, I want you now to take this love, to take the power of this beautiful picture and bring it into the world. So the church is a big deal. It carries a huge place in the heart of God. Um, this family's not here, so I can scandal about them. <laughs> I, I want to just give an example of this. Um, it's Ian and Sue Garrett. Oh, Sue is here. <laughs> Sue, can you please leave the room for a little while? <laughs> I, I spoke about them yesterday at our leaders meeting and they've, they've just, the way they do life has really blessed me. Ian buzzed me the other day and said, God, do you have the calendar for the year, for the entire year? Because they do a lot of traveling. they um, involved in owning lodges, beautiful lodges. And so they need to do a lot of traveling for marketing purposes, etc. Can you give us the calendar so that we can fit our flight schedules around the rocks in the church. Isn't that amazing? So their flights are booked around what God's doing in CU Wide River. Sorry to embarrass you, Sue. Sorry, but I'm not. Because it's so helpful to have those life examples. It's kingdom. They've got this thing of kingdom. I've told the story before, and I want to say it again is that when we led a church in Scottborough many years ago, we had a friend who who'd passed away of cancer. Andy Wimble was his name. And he phoned me up the one day. He was an a, um, insurance salesman. And he traveled KZN quite extensively. And he was going past Scottborough one day to far south coast, then coming back again in the afternoon. He said, Guy, I want to drop something off with you. Uh, I don't have time. Can you meet me on the highway? So I said, yeah, sure. Met him there. And he said, sorry, I'm rushing this. I've got to get back to prayer meeting in Maritzburg. Now, I, I knew this man really well. Spent a lot of time with him. He, he, he designed his time frame. His calendar was built around the big rocks in the church. All his travels, to the best of his ability, were around these big rocks. And he was at almost every function because he was his own boss. So he, was, he had the privilege of doing that. I'm just giving you some examples of what this thing could look like. We have a personal call, but then we have this, this corporate call. And that's what we want to do today with Involvement Sunday is to give you an opportunity. After I've spoken, Eugene's going to come and a whole bunch of ministry leaders are going to just take 90 seconds each to tell you what areas you could perhaps get involved in. And it's fun and there's lots of banter and you can sign up afterwards. But you've got to catch the heart before you do that of why you're doing it. We've, we've um, adopted this little saying, involvement equals belonging. There's something about when people feel like they belong in a family. It's the same in a family context. When a, fam a healthy family has this, this sense of we belong because we're involved. When everyone plays a part in the family, it's a healthy family. It's the same in the church. Involvement equals belonging. People that are on the fringes suddenly change when they get involved. And because of time, I'm going to go straight to a video, um, two and a half minutes long, and then I'm going to hand over to Eugene. Let me just pray for us. May God stir your heart as we give opportunity later for you to hear God where He wants you to be involved. May He stir your heart. It doesn't mean you're signing up forever. Do it for a year. And then at the end of the year, reassess. Join another ministry if you want. It doesn't really matter. Just be faithful to what you feel Him telling you to do. So Lord, I pray as we talk about our calling and the beauty of being involved in local church, that you would show people this morning where they should be, what they should be doing in your church. Lord, would you do this so well. Would you just stir hearts, just let lights come on. 
as you bring direction in Jesus' name. Watch this two-minute video. It really sums up everything we say. Then, Eugene, you can take over. If I'm honest, I never really liked the church. I didn't even really like Christians that much. I used to think of it like a package deal. Like, you get Jesus, and so you get the church and Christians thrown. It's just part of the package. And uh, there are some bits you like Jesus, some bits you don't like so much. Just like the church and Christians um, used to find that a bit annoying. But I'd turn up the church and go through it. I didn't really enjoy going to church. And then one day uh, I was at the back of our church in East London and someone said to me, oh, we need help to run the coffee team. And I was like, I was like working like 70, 80 hour week. I'm like, what? And they were like, yeah, we, Steve, we really need your help running the coffee team on a Sunday. And I was thinking, I'm a barrister, I'm not a barista. Like, I've got a job. I don't need another job to run a coffee team. But I just, you know, sometimes you, you just can't even think of what to say. So I was like, Okay, I'll do it, I'll do it, okay. And, and I instantly thought, why did I do that? So I turn up next week, like, you know, trying to get the cups and everything, get the coffee right. As I handed these cups to people, something really changed in me. I found myself, as I handed coffee to these people, growing in love with them. I was like, these people are amazing. Like, this is this extraordinarily diverse community. It's been gathered from across the area, probably not another place that looks as diverse and integrated as this. This is a miracle. And then I, even people I found a little bit more frustrating and complicated, as I handed them their coffee, I kind of grew in love with them. And I kind of basically fell in love with the church. And then I kind of went back to the person who'd asked me to do it. I said, we need a new coffee machine. We need better beans. We need better mugs. Like, we come on, these are amazing people. I want this to be the best coffee that they get. You know, they, they're coming to church on a Sunday morning. I got more and more passionate. I started to build a team to serve coffee on a Sunday morning. I sometimes say, Making coffee changed my life because I fell in love with the Church of Jesus Christ. I didn't realize why it was special. I didn't realize why it mattered. And as I made coffee for people, I suddenly realized, oh, the church is like the bride of Jesus Christ. It's like the thing he gave himself for. Like the church is God's plan for the salvation of the world. There's no plan B and God is gonna build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So like, God is putting all his eggs in the church basket. And I realized over those few weeks, there's a beautiful thing here. Yes, it messes up. Yes, it makes mistakes. You'll never find a perfect church, but it's a beautiful thing. And I thought, that's what I want to spend my life building. I think that was put so well. Sorry, so, um, we're going to start, everybody um, that um, is leading a ministry is going to come up, talk for 90 seconds, 90 seconds, you also said 90 seconds, no? so we agree it's 90 seconds, no? okay, so 90 seconds, everybody's going to have a time, there's not enough, not enough time for everybody to talk more than that, so um, I'm going to ask the guys to come up front and stand there, if you can, in a, in a nice row, um, I'm going to kick it off with uh, the prayer ministry. Next will be Craig. Next will be Marissa on music. Alec on sound. Lucinda on media. Bernie on welcome. Eric on set up, which is um, a lot to do with coffee. Um, Talita says new coffee machine. <laughs> um, Jean for events. Graham for father and kids, which is a new ministry. Glenda, Recovery Group, Ian, Ongoing, kids, Cheryl for Kidsmen, and uh, Peter on the Youth. All right. Yes. So when we get to the point where you go over 90 seconds, I kid you not, I am going to ring a big, a big 100% solid brass bell. What? You think there's no power in this? You'll see. All right. So don't be, don't mislead this, don't let this mislead you people. Okay, so I'm going to kick it off. So I don't have notes, but I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to just look, say again? Five seconds is not over. I'm still introducing, guys. Introducing, guy. <laughs> All right, so 
I am going to start now. So, the prayer group. We meet on Thursdays at 5 o'clock in the office up here. Um, we pray for things of the church. There's a, um, any situation, any um, program that we want, we're the guys who start off with. If you understand the power of the prayer to our Lord and Savior, join us. And if you want to know what it is like, this is more or less what it sounds like. Lord Father God, we worship you, we praise you because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the one that put this church together. You are the one that run it, Lord. Lord, we ask you to be faithful servants to your church, Lord. We ask you that you will use us. Holy Spirit, I ask you today in this church that you would fill people's hearts in this church, Lord. That you would burn in them a desire to join one of these groups, Lord. To be part of what you have done, Lord. Lord, we worship you in everything, Lord. You are our King, Lord. We want your name. We want your kingdom to come, Lord. We want you to be made great, Lord. Yes, Lord, we love you, Lord. I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would fill this church now. Amen. I've got 15 seconds to spare. <laughs> All right, so the next one would be Greg. I'm taking your 12 seconds. Okay, I'm starting now. Uh, my name's Craig, my wife and I, uh, my wife, my, my wife and I, Brenda, she's in the States right now advocating for Sinani, which is what I'm a part of. We lead that, that ministry. It's the regional outreach for Church Unlimited. And our mission is to mobilize, encourage, and equip the church to care for the spiritual and physical needs of orphans and vulnerable children. Sinani is a great way to put your faith into action. And so Richard was talking about holy ground yesterday. And for me, holy ground is standing in the presence of the poor. Why do I say this? Because it's very important to Jesus. And when you join us on a home visit and you look into the eyes of the destitute, you encounter Jesus. You live out Matthew 25, 35, and James 1, 27, and probably a whole bunch of other scriptures. Guys, people from all over the world sacrifice their time, their holiday, and their resources to come here to be a part of the privilege to do what I just described. In fact, we've got teams coming soon. But you guys have a backstage pass. So, how do you get involved? There's two ways. There's more than two ways, but the first way this year we've decided to make it easy. Wow. That's one way. Come on the 24th and then join our volunteer thing there. When I was a young boy, I used to, I used to, <laughs> let's do this quickly. Come join with me. Come on, let's stand up quickly, quickly. I don't have lots of time. 150, Psalm 150. Read with me, please. Praise the Lord. I can't hear you. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty. I can't hear you. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet and the electric and the acoustic and the drum and the piano and all of that. And then it goes on to say, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Do you have breath? Yes, so you part of the worship team. Get me right. This is not the worship team. You are the worship team. So when we sing, I thank you for worshiping with us. This is the band, the skilled instruments and the singers. So if you have any skill or training in music or singing, you are welcome to put your name on the list. Okay. And then worship evenings. If you want to come experience an hour, hour and a half of worship, Please join us for our worship evenings. It's extraordinary. And remember, you're part of the worship team, so you need to be here. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so I get three minutes because I'm speaking about two ministries. <laughs> so do you hear that? Love with you. 
So all the music that's going on, that's part of the team that's at the back. So that's the sound. It might sound funny because I'm here now. I'm not there to make the bass sound nice. So, but we've got a media team and we've got a sound team. So the sound team is split into two. You do the sound. So if I sound really loud now, I apologize. I am not there to turn myself down. <laughs> we do the lighting as well. Okay, that wasn't me. <laughs> so the sound and lighting, and then we do the media. So you'll see all the media slides that's going on here. That's what we do at the back. So if you like to do something in the background, please come and join us. So the sound, it's awesome. We work on the sound desk, but we ask you, you need to have an ear for music. I mean, if you, if you can identify the different instruments, like you know this is a piano, and you know that is the drums, and you can identify the different sounds, we'd love to have you there. <laughs> But if it's hard for you to identify music or harmonies or so forth, um, we understand, we love you. You can, you can come here and sing along with Maria and them. And so, yeah, we do that. So we'd love to have more people. We've got a very, very small group that does the sound. And we'd just like to encourage you guys to come through. Okay, so I've got another minute and a half left. They just showed me. Um, so that's with regards to the sound and the lighting. And then we also do this video recording. So hello to the online people. <laughs> Um, and then we do the media, so if you like to do the songs, you want to go through the songs, you, uh, you just feel you want something like that to serve behind the scenes. Um, we do all the music, we do the slides during the sermon, so if there's not verses and stuff up there, please do not think it's our fault. <laughs> Sometimes the preachers, they don't give us that, but we try and be promptly, we try and give you verses. So if you've got that intuition, um, and also just know that the Lord is with us at the back. So even if you're behind the scenes, you need to work with the Holy Spirit because this is a unity. What goes on in front and what goes on in the back is one team. We need to work together. So we'd love to have you. Please sign up. We'll be out there. Okay, so uh, there's so many ministries to sign up for, and I know that I am biased, but really the welcome team is such a beautiful team to be part of. It's a wonderful way to serve God. Yes, you can carry on clapping. So uh, if you have a voice and a friendly smile, you qualify. And by the way, 90 seconds is far too fast. <laughs> It's, it's, it's too long, actually. I don't need 90 seconds. So if you have a voice and a friendly smile, I will see you outside there because the welcome team is very important. Our visitors need to feel welcome. So if you have a heart for, for new people, please come and be part of what we're doing. Thank you. Right, um, I represent the setup team. We're a humble bunch, but um, Guy has made it clear that we are the most important ministry by talking about coffee before we started. So <laughs> there are four of us, uh, four teams. You'll be on one every four weeks. Uh, hopefully we'll make a fifth team this year because the church has grown. Uh, our lofty mission is to provide an environment where you can experience God. And we do that through a few simple things. For example, the welcome at the gate, you're welcome before you even enter the building and then Bernie takes over. Um, we try and find you a seat and make sure there's limited distractions during the service. Uh, we make tea and coffee probably the prime part so that you can engage, fellowship and get to know each other. So if you like to be behind the scenes and not up in the limelight, please come and join us. We have a lot of fun and it's a great place to start serving if you're not sure about what to do. Cheers. Good morning, church. Um, the events is basically feeding people and making our church look beautiful for all of you. There's nothing more um, inspiring than having a, a meal together. Fellowship is so very important. It's not like it's going to was through Alpha where we cooked for almost 11 weeks for 240, 260 people every week. This is every four to six weeks. If we have a worship evening, have, we have a prayer evening where we get together as a church, we have something to eat, to drink, 
the place looks beautiful, and we worship our mighty Lord. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just introducing the, the new fathers and kids group. Um, what this is all about is launching our kids from our shoulders, sending them further than what we are. And I want to invite all the fathers. We want to make the fathers great. What you're doing, we want to make that great. We need fathers that are about to become fathers. We need fathers of every age group of kids. And we also need fathers that kids have left the home because there's a lot of kids in this church that don't have fathers and they need fathers again. So we're asking the fathers to come out. We're going to make cohorts of fathers and do stuff. We're going to learn how to do stuff and we're going to get excited about doing stuff with our kids. And yeah, I'd really like to oh, encourage all of you to come and join us to do it. Sure, he made it. Give him another hand. <laughs> Do you all hate the devil? Are you moved by the plight of broken people? Do you have a desire to build up the brokenhearted, bind them up according to Isaiah, help heal shattered lives? Are you ready for a challenge that's going to knock you out of your chair in your comfort zone? The recovery ministry is a place for you. It's twofold. First of all, we go to White River Recovery Center once a week where we minister in the Word and in prayer. We come alongside people at their most vulnerable as they determine to walk free of addictions and to restore relationships with their families. We see week after week God answering prayer in these lives and in their families' lives. On the raw side, we have Sino Tando, a ministry started by Fazam Mujaha. He's not here in this church, but he's a part of us. They go onto the streets of Nelspreit every week and minister to the Niope and heroin addicts. They see life at its absolute worst, despair, desperation, total breakdown. Seven months ago, we were privileged enough to get a home in uh, one of the communities, Hilari, we take these guys in, it's a 24-7 commitment. Ministering the word, we've started a vegetable garden for them, skill shares, trying to teach them to get their lives back together again and be worthwhile people. This is prodigal son ministry in action. The reward is the absolute and sublime joy when breakthrough and release happens. It is a moment of woo, rejoicing. The one has come home. So join us. One of the most beautiful things is that when you experience the working of God in and through your life, when you are just yourself, and that's what we do, is that we go and express the love of God outside of this local church. It's going into other churches. It's just being the very best that you can be for God. Going and serving, uh, washing dishes, praying for people, uh, just being part of the group. It's teamwork. And what we do is we go into places like, for instance, on the 25th, we're going out to Vaudeville Boven. We're going to take up that whole service, do the worship, do the children's ministry, do the preaching. We're linking up with the church in Barberton. And all we're doing is just being ourselves for God. So it doesn't matter who you are. We're all qualified for that. We all have this, this ability just to share the very love of Christ in whatever way God has gifted us. And that's what going does. We've got uh, the Sabi down the road. There's Malalan coming up. We go to Barberton. We go to Bourbon. We go to Eswatini. We go to Mozambique. And just serving together, being a team together, sharing the love of God out there. And that's what going does. So we really encourage you to sign up for that. Good morning. So, with Kids Ministry this year, we kicked off with an eight-week series on Better Together. We're teaching the kids how best to serve and care for our community and one another. And so this is where you guys can come in. We are hoping to encourage you as a family to help serve and raise up the next generation of children who passionately love and follow Jesus. This is how you guys can get involved. Let me just stand out the way. 
So you can get involved by being part of the leaders or the helper team on Sundays. It's about 12 Sundays in a year, and it's on a four-team rotational, bo- um, uh, rotational basis. And then we're also asking parents and more men to get involved in kids' ministry on Sundays. Then also being on the registration table to help um, sign in kids. We also want in a craft and a sewing team. If you're interested in that, the craft team works during the week um, up front um, so that the, the leaders on Sundays have their lessons and crafts. And then also junior youth. We do junior youth once a term, so if you're keen to help there as well as a kids' camp in September from the 13th to the 15th of September. There you can be on the team. You can either do food or fundraising for the kids' camp. You can be on a decor team or you can be on anything else. So as you can see, we are better together. So please sign up with this awesome ministry. Well done, guys and girls. Stop taking my time. Uh, I'm just going to read you some inspirational quotes. 40 is the old age of youth. 50, the youth of old age. Invest in the potential of youth skills and watch the world transform into a masterpiece. If you babysit the youth, you get babies. If you lead the youth, you get leaders. Enjoy your youth. You'll never be younger than you are at this moment. With the youth team, you're going to help us out with Friday youth, Sunday youth, youth live groups once a month, and activities like camps. We need help with tuck shops, connect teams, games, logistics, and teaching. You will be humbled by the teenagers. They are jumping Red Bull bunnies full of energy. So we want you to match the same energy. I'm just going to give you a bit of a sneak peek of how youth works on Fridays and Sundays. Hello everyone, welcome to youth. My name is Peter. I used to have an afro, guys. Dylan, where's that photo? That's real, guys. I broke like seven combs on that thing. So, yeah, guys, we're just going to go into a time of games now, and then I'm going to bring the message. Just remember, um, games, it's not about having fun, hey? It's about winning, so, yeah. <laughs> But great to have you here. Enjoy. Beautiful. Awesome. I didn't realize I was closing up. Thank you for coming. Go sign up. Um, If you have never given your heart to Jesus, and you're here today in the midst of this unusual service, and you feel it's time, you've led your own life for too long, and you want to have the privilege like we have had of becoming a follower of Jesus, come and see us afterwards. Otherwise, bless you, have a lucky week, go sign up, have some coffee, cheers.